Welcome to this video from Learn Electrics about kitchen electrics. We see lots of questions posted about kitchens and we hope to show you with some simple drawings what you should consider when working in kitchens. Some of the more frequent questions have included things like Are there any special rules for kitchens? What size cable should I use for the cooker? Can I put a socket next to the sink? and lots more. So let's begin with sockets next to sinks. What can we do and what should we avoid doing? We want to protect sockets from splashes of water from the sink. A recommended minimum distance of 300 millimeters from the edge of the sink to the edge of the outlet is the expected norm. On inspections you will come across sockets much closer to the sink and even behind the sink. All you can do is to bring this to the customer's attention and mark it as improvement recommended. On a new circuit we should abide by the 300mm recommendation and 30mA RCD protection. The centre line height of socket outlets above a work surface should be at least 150mm or 6 inches. This is to limit the amount of bending that the flex will undergo as the plug is inserted and removed from the outlet. If the flex is bent over too much, damage to the fine conductor wires inside will happen over time. Now we can look at sockets under worktops. Sometimes a world of surprises, especially if the kitchen units have been retrofitted as part of a kitchen refurbishment. The frequent ones here are washing machines, dishwashers, fridges and freezers. These should have a switched FCU or module switch that is easily accessible above the work surface that is then controlling a dedicated unswitched socket at the rear of the appliance. Why you might ask? If the washing machine is plugged into a switched socket and then starts to vibrate and move on a spin cycle, will the washing machine pipes catch the switch and turn the appliance off. And more importantly, if there is no accessible means of turning off the power above the worktop, what happens if the washing machine jams on a spin cycle, which does happen, and cannot be turned off? With a switch that is mounted above the work surface, it can easily disconnect the power and the problem can then be sorted with a stationary machine. You or I may go to the consumer unit and turn the circuit breaker off, but many people don't think of that. And do consider where the socket is installed. Is access to it easy? Will water drip onto the outlet? If you're installing a new circuit, can the outlet be positioned away from potential drips and water leaks? Likewise, sockets directly below a sink are not recommended for the same reasons. Let's consider cookers now. A lot is common sense, so let's have a look. Where should we locate socket outlets, or indeed any accessory, in relation to the hob? It is recommended that they are positioned at least 150mm from the edge of the hob. This will limit problems from splashes when cooking and heat damage to plugs and flexes that are plugged into the outlet. Cooker switches or cooker control plates should also be at least 150mm from the edge of the hob for the same reasons. Plus, they should not be installed more than 2 meters or 2000 millimeters from the cooker. The idea here is that, in an emergency, it is no more than a single step and a stretch to reach the switch and isolate the power. Do not position the cooker control plate directly behind the hob for obvious reasons. If a pan catches fire, who, in their right mind, is going to reach through the flames to turn the cooker off? And, as mentioned earlier, most people will not think to isolate at the consumer unit. You'll come across houses from the 50s and 60s when it was common to put the switch behind the hob. And I can remember exactly this scenario in the house that I grew up in. And for the same reasons, do not position socket outlets, switched spurs or any accessory 
directly behind the hob, always to the side in a safe and accessible position. Some kitchens will have the hob and oven physically distanced from each other with only one cooker switch controlling both appliances. This is perfectly acceptable. The cooker control plate can be positioned between the hob and the oven, but it must be within two meters of both appliances and the maximum total load should not exceed 50 50 amps. Ovens, hobs, cookers and combinations should be on their own separate circuit with a clearly identified circuit breaker back at the consumer unit. However, the regulations do permit an oven that is below 2 kW rating to be connected to a ring circuit that is otherwise lightly loaded. We are sometimes asked to change the cooker switch or cooker control plate. A popular request might be to replace the existing cooker switch that has no outlet to one that does incorporate a socket outlet. Be aware that we are not changing like for like, we are adding a socket to the circuit. This means that the circuit must now be 30 milliamp RCD protected. In many dwellings, 30 milliamp RCD protection may already be in place. If not, it will need to be supplied. If a type AC RCD is already installed, it can stay in place. If supplying new, then a type A RCD should be fitted to BSEN 61008 or BSEN 61009 as examples. The type A or B or F RCD will accommodate any DC components in modern appliances. We must also consider cable safe zones. Where do we run cables in kitchens and where should we not run cables? Cable safe zones should be run vertically or horizontally from each accessory. The accessory is your marker as to where cables might be, making it easy to identify possible routes. They might be vertically above or below the accessory, they might be horizontally to the left or right, so we don't want to be drilling in those zones. The top 150mm of the wall next to the ceiling is also a safe zone. We should not be putting screws for kitchen cupboards into the wall in this top zone. It is also considered bad practice to run cables diagonally across the wall. When plastered over or tiled, how do we know where the cable run is? If we're installing something on the wall, away from accessories, are we about to drill through the cooker cable? And I will leave a link in the description to a Learn Electrics video that gives a lot more detail about safe zones. If a cable must be run diagonally or otherwise outside the safe cable zones, then additional measures to prevent damage to cables and electric shock will need to be implemented. These will include 30 milliamp RCDs, metallic coverings, adequate depth, etc. But ideally, just don't run cables diagonally. The poor guy that must repair and replace that cooker cable will also find out that those expensive tiles are no longer made and there is no near match. We should also mention cable sizes or CSA of cooker cables. A frequent question on chat rooms is what size cooker can I connect to the existing cables? Non-electrical people fail to realise that you can't just upgrade to a bigger cooker without considering the size of cable that is already installed. Shown here are the two popular sizes or cross-sectional areas of cooker cables. Installed as reference method C, a 6mm twin earth cable will be adequate for a 7.5 kW cooker on a 32 amp circuit breaker. For a cooker up to 9.5 kW, the cable will need to be 10mm twin and earth if reference method C is applied. Other factors may affect your choice of cable size, grouping of cables, ambient temperatures, cables passing through thermal insulation and so on. They will all affect the cable's current carrying capacity. Also shown in the tables 
is the next cable size up. Many installations will still be wired in the old wiring colours and you need to be aware of this. With the new harmonised twin earth colours of brown and blue conductors with a bare CPC, we can have white sheathed cable which is thermosetting and has LSHF fire and smoke properties. Or the standard grey sheathed thermoplastic PVC cable. Easy to tell the difference, one is white, the other is grey. With the old wiring colours of red, black and a bare CPC, twin and earth cable was available as the standard thermoplastic PVC cable in both white and grey. So old colours in white sheathing do not mean LSHF cable. And finally, a moment or two on the Welsh Part P regulations relating to kitchens. Work in a kitchen in a Welsh dwelling may need to be notified under Part P of the building regulations as the English and Welsh requirements are different. A kitchen is defined as an area with a sink and food preparation facilities and extends three metres from the edge of the sink. In Welsh kitchens, there are notification requirements for Part P that must be adhered to. It's OK to replace an existing light fitting, faulty switch or socket outlet like for like without notification. But almost all other work in Welsh kitchens is notifiable under Part P of the building regulations. If the Welsh house has a large open plan kitchen dining room, where does the kitchen stop and the dining room start? The easiest way is to use a three metre long piece of string or a tape measure and with one end of the string touching the edge of the sink, wherever that string can reach is considered to be part of the kitchen. Beyond three metres is considered outside the zone and becomes the dining room area. The zone also stops when it reaches a wall or a door that can be closed. And there we are, Kitchen Electrics. We hope that you've enjoyed this video and thank you for watching. It really is appreciated. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos and remember to click on Notify to be sure of not missing our next video. And you'll find even more information, videos and help on our website at learnelectrics.com And don't forget that you can also type in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel, so don't miss the next one. And once again, thank you for watching, and we hope to see you again very soon.